Welcome to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. I make a rare real estate prediction that's sure to include some things that you've never thought about before, some hands-on ways to improve your property's market appeal, then here in a time of higher unemployment and during all times, there's a way to guarantee that your rent income arrives today on Get Rich Education. Congress just made it possible to get up to $100,000 out of your current 401k or TSP to invest in real estate, gold, or even your own business. That's even if you're still working and avoid the IRA UBIT tax. The thing is, you can get your money tax and penalty free for a limited time. The EQRP is your secret weapon. With the CARES Act expiring soon, the EQRP company helps you unleash your retirement funds now. Learn more and text message EQRP in all capital letters to 72000 you're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world this is get rich education Welcome to GRE from Huntington, Pennsylvania to Huntington Beach, California and across 188 nations worldwide. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. You know, I appear as a guest on other shows and one question I'm often asked is, what do you see in your crystal ball? What do you think is next for the housing market? Well, at its core, real estate economics is about supply and demand. Yes, we already know that home buyer demand is surging due to low interest rates, low inventory, the pandemic, and riots, especially in the suburbs and rural areas. But where do I think it's going next? After all, a foreclosure moratorium is in place until the end of the year. Well, with the unemployment rate still high, some homeowners have fallen behind. On their mortgage payments, a moratorium on foreclosures keeps them from losing their home through year end. Well, when the moratorium expires and they can't catch up on their payments, that homeowner could be foreclosed upon. A number of people could lose their homes. As sad as this is for the former homeowner, it could bring some badly needed supply onto the market. And I call this shadow inventory. Inventory that's going to open up onto the market later. Yeah, that could happen. But could that make home prices stop rising? That is a firm no. I don't believe that will happen. In fact, I think home prices will continue to rise for the foreseeable future. And not just for one reason, but for a number of reasons. Look, America is already undersupplied by 2.5 to 3.3 million housing units, depending on the source. We already have an affordable housing crisis where demand is dramatically outstripping supply. So this potential shadow inventory, though, that could come out of the market if some homeowners are foreclosed upon. But that is going to be eclipsed by shadow demand. Now, above and beyond this undersupplied condition, there is pent up demand and it's building. And there are three reasons for this. More young adults are living with their parents. We have home builder roadblocks and we have population growth. So let's break this down. More than half of young adults in the United States now live with their parents. More than half the share of 18 to 29 year olds living with their parents has surged to 52 percent. That is according to a Pew Research study. Yes, this even surpasses the previous peak that was hit in the 1930s Great Depression. When the pandemic ends, hiring is going to take place. New employment will gain momentum, and that's when younger people will become independent again because few want to live with their parents into their 30s. Staying up playing video games until 2 in the morning just doesn't mesh very well with your parents. Well, this pent-up demand that's building from young adults living at home, that's going to eventually have to be released into the housing market. There's going to be new household formation then. So You thought the housing market was hot and tight now. Just wait until that happens. More people then are going to be looking to both rent and own a home. Now, another reason for this shadow demand, this pent up demand, is home builder roadblocks. I've personally spoken on the phone and over Zoom with home builders in Utah and Arizona 
and Florida recently, they've all stopped building for myriad reasons. They're not building. Now, some are, but many aren't. And the top factor for the building freeze is astoundingly high lumber prices. I've touched on that before. The short story is that a lot of lumber mills had to curtail or shut down to prevent the spread of the virus. Well, that represents your housing supply right there. That means new supply can't come from there anymore. We're talking about things in the framing of houses like the trusses, and we're talking about the floor joists and the panels and the studs. Southern yellow pine is a popular lumber for that. Some spruce and pine and fir is used too. And the prices of two by fours and two by sixes has shot up to more than double the market price that you were seeing just last year. Now that price has begun to come down somewhat and I don't watch the lumber futures market, but lumber supply efficiency is just not there. And then another reason that's going to keep housing demand high relative to low supply well, I think a lot of people overlook the obvious, although you're probably more aware of it, and that is population growth. Though the pandemic is rattling America's population growth, it has grown every single year for 100 years. The U.S. population has grown 100 of the last 100 years. Even with a slower growth rate, if it did slow down, population is forecast to grow annually for at least 40 more years. In fact, do you have any idea how many Americans are added to the population every single day? Any guess? Of course, you need to factor in more than births and deaths into this. You must factor in immigration as well. That figure is about 4,800. 4,800 new Americans are created every day. We've been adding 2 million residents every year lately, and all these people have to live somewhere, and you can be the one to provide them with sound rental housing. So that's my prediction. Housing will continue to have a substantial appreciation rate for both the short term and the intermediate term, and that's due to our gross undersupply that we currently have, plus all this pent-up demand that's building. Or maybe you prefer the term shadow demand from adults living at home with their parents, home builder roadblocks, and persistent population growth. Those are my whys. They are the foundation behind the prediction. Now, I don't often make predictions, and what we think will happen doesn't always happen, but there are so many reasons for what I just described as happening. Now, a couple years ago, I said that I didn't see what would make real estate go up more than its appreciation rate of about 4% or so at that time, but it sure has. I think a lot of people got that one wrong because... Americans just don't really have any recollection of what a pandemic is like. And then beyond that, no one knew that a pandemic would cause housing prices to surge either. Remember back earlier this year when the pandemic was new, I asked at least one guest, maybe two guests on the show, if they thought housing prices were going to go down, and they sure haven't. If you're looking for prescience, not all that long ago, I did an episode here named A Recession is Coming, and just like everyone else, I didn't know when, though, or what form it would take. Last year, I did a GRE episode called The Power of Now, you probably remember that one, where I said then, whatever you do, don't delay too much gratification in life. You never know what tomorrow's going to bring. Get married. Visit Japan. Whatever you want to do, do that thing now. And then the pandemic hit, and see, it's not so easy to do those things now. Then as recently as last November, I did an episode called Planning for a Recession, which was, well, just months before it hit. Anyway, if you're a longtime listener here, chances are you are better prepared and in better shape than the average American, and you've been buying plenty of these smaller rental housing units at scale, and they're in such demand these days. Now, a lot of what I've talked about there has more to do with appreciation, but what about your tenant rent income? In fact, that represents at least two of the five ways that you typically profit, both with cash flow and the tenant made pay down of your loan. Is more federal stimulus coming, like stepped up unemployment compensation or the Paycheck Protection Program or just an outright $1,200 stimulus check to Americans who qualify for it? Is that coming again? Well, we've played plenty of Trump clips here over the years, and he's been 
rather uneven about what he's thought for another stimulus. You know, journalists have been doing a better job lately of holding public officials' feet to the fire, pressing them on issues. Here's CNN's Wolf Blitzer as he asked House Speaker Nancy Pelosi about more stimulus. This is CNN. $1.8 trillion is a lot of money. The American people need that money ASAP because they're suffering right now. And I, I'm, I'm not saying it's perfect, but I'm and saying... And you don't care how it's spent. And well, I, you don't care I care, how of it's course, spent. how it's spent. But I, what I well, don't, don't understand even know is how it's why spent. not, why not talk to the president spent. personally, call him up and say, Mr. President, let's get a deal tomorrow. Look, let me say this. The president has sent Mr. Mnuchin to negotiate. That's what we've done with other presidents. This isn't unusual. It's not about me. It's about millions of Americans who can't put food on the table, who can't pay the rent, and who are we having represent trouble, them. And who we are represent them. getting and by we represent on these them. long food and lines we represent that we're seeing. Them. I know we you know are. Them. The interview went on like that. Of course, as usual, get the link to that and all of the resources that we mentioned today at getricheducation.com slash 316. Let's talk about some hands-on ways to improve your property's market appeal. Even if you use property managers for your properties like I do, this is going to help you. Now, my single-family rental homes are completely occupied, but I do have a few apartment units vacant right now. One problem I had is with one annoying spot remaining on this wall-to-wall -wall carpeting after the tenant had moved out. One stain, and it's hard to take all of your tenant's security deposit for an entire room's carpeting over one spot a lot of times. Now, how I approach this, this can also serve you if you have some sort of burn mark or blemish on your hard surface flooring too. Luxury vinyl plank or laminate hardwood, same concept. Here's how you handle that blemished area. You cover it up with a throw rug. Yep, cover it up. We had an apartment unit that was lingering vacant too long. I asked the manager to send me some photos and I could see that this spotted area reduced the tenant appeal. Now, what is this anyway? Is this some add-on to the common rental scams like we were talking about last week with Garrett Sutton and I'm behind this scam? No, that's not what I'm talking about at all. After you cover the blemish with the throw rug, be sure to disclose that fact in the listing. That's something you would tell the tenant about during showings and let them have the free throw rug. Yes, some tenants feel happy to get a free $80 throw rug. And when you show them that it covers a blemish, they actually appreciate you and feel like you're being open and disclose things to them. Part of being a profitable rental owner is the speed of the turnaround in your vacancy. And if you must, covering something up with a throw rug and disclosing it is a quick way. Some other things that you can do to a vacant unit to give you a big bang for the buck are paint. It's an obvious one, but painting walls in trim is probably the easiest way to make a unit more appealing. A light gray bear paint, that's brand bear, B-E-H-R, on walls, and then a semi-gloss white on your trim. They are the colors that tenants tend to like these days. I'm talking interior there. I actually just had the exterior of one of my apartment buildings painted almost those colors too. Update the light fixtures, clean, new modern light fixtures like track lights, pendant lights, nickel plated fixtures. They're not much more expensive than regular fixtures, but they really pop. Kitchen cabinetry really helps. Some tenants think of the kitchen as the heart of the home and cabinets are that thing that they see right there at eye level. So think about how your tenant would think. And a lot of times they are the same exact things that you would want yourself. And often you don't have to replace the cabinets, paint the existing ones, and then put new hardware on them, new handles and things. That alone can transform a kitchen. Another place where you get substantial renovation bang for your buck is with bathroom vanities. They are pretty inexpensive and can really make a bathroom feel more modern and updated. A new front door, that is a place that can really help you out. After all, it is your tenant's first impression of a unit. A dented front door, that is going to turn off your prospective tenant before they even walk inside the unit. And a divoted door can be really problematic. Just think about what the tenant is thinking. If the divot is a certain shape, like a bullet, they might even question the safety of an entire neighborhood. So 
Those are some fairly inexpensive places to focus on for getting your vacant unit rented out more quickly. And yes, if I have a unit that seems stubborn to get rented out, I ask the property manager to send me pictures and then I might advise them from there. Now, we talk about the government passing a stimulus bill to aid unemployed tenants and homeowners. Just imagine if there was a permanent government program that's continuously existed for almost 50 years that would pay a tenant's rent for them right to you. That's how solid it is and how it can be expected. Well, yeah, such a program actually exists and it has nothing to do with the pandemic. It exists independent of that. I'm going to discuss the pros and cons of that program next. We're talking about how you can get guaranteed rent income from your tenant. But first, you know, in the past few weeks, I wrote you more about my housing predictions, something that I don't do very often. And I delivered that to you in our Don't Quit Your Daydream email newsletter. Other things that I informed you about that way within the last month include who exactly I use for my own tax planning, tax strategy, and tax preparation to take advantage of that big basket of tax benefits that real estate investors get. In this ultra-hot housing market that we're in, I wrote to you and carefully outlined the 16 ways that you can avoid getting into a bidding war and all the time and money that that's going to save you. If those ideas sound useful to you, I would really like to have you as a subscriber to my Don't Quit Your Daydream letter, which is completely free. You can make sure that you don't miss out at getricheducation.com slash letter. I also call the most germane economics and real estate investing related news stories from the past week or two. And I have those story links in the letter. A lot of those are articles that you're going to miss otherwise, like one that recently described why America is becoming a renter nation. Also, a few weeks ago, I gave my why real estate presentation when I was the kickoff speaker for the Spartan Real Estate Summit. I'm going to make that one hour video available to you. We'll be sending that out in the letter sometime soon too, where I really bring the five ways you're paid to life and so much more in that one hour video. There's even more than that that I want to send you, but you get all the good stuff, no spam and unsubscribe anytime. And hey, you've got to do something on those six days a week when there's no GRE podcast. You can hit pause on your podcatcher now and sign up at getricheducation.com slash letter. More next, I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. Most runner property investors choose either positive cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market can provide both Jacksonville, Florida, with 9% lower home prices than the national median, 1% higher gross rents, and Jacksonville has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets since 1991. Get positive cash flow today and appreciation for tomorrow. To invest for cash flow and growth in Jacksonville, go to cashflowandgrowth.com. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans, and they finance single-family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is Ridge Lending Group's president, Shaley Ridge. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. And remember, don't quit your daydream. She runs operations here at GRE. I'd like to welcome Andrea Newburn back onto the show. Thank you for having me, Keith. Audrey, before our chat, what's something interesting that's happened to you this past week? Well, Keith, normally I would say nothing too interesting most weeks, but I have a couple. I have a housing related and a non-housing related. Tell me. Non-housing related. I got to fly up to Detroit this weekend and spend some time with my husband's family and we did some house shopping for our second home. So that was a lot of fun. And it's somewhat housing related, but not investment. You're based in Georgia. Your in-laws are in Michigan. You're potentially looking to move there. That's right. Yep. We're looking to probably spend half the year there and half the year down here in Georgia. 
investment related, I just finished up my most recent flip and we listed it on the market a couple of days ago. So getting a lot of traction from that and excited to see what that sells for. Yeah, great stuff there. Something that interesting that's happened to me this past week, kind of a real estate problem at home, if you will, is cottonwood trees are overtaking my backyard. And these things are a problem. They're like the bullies of the forest. They'll take over your yard. They spew this cottony stuff in the summertime that give people allergies. So I'm trying to hack down these trees myself. And of course, as you know, my first instinct is to outsource the job. But when I had some tree service companies come over, they wanted to bring in this 4,000 pound equipment that would have messed up our landscape and all that. So I've become the DIYer. And of course, I'm finding is, there are a few acronyms more expensive than DIY. It typically takes <laughs> me twice as long as what I would think. So Andrea, you were last with us five weeks ago. You talked about how to avoid a real estate bidding war then. And just to review for the listener, Andrea, she has her MBA in finance. She runs the operations here at GRE, like I said. She is an active real estate agent in her home state of Georgia. She kind of though has that PhD in doing where she's added 28 rental doors in just the last three years. And Andrea, you've really tried and sampled a lot of different things in the real estate world. And what I mean is you've tried short-term rentals. You let us know when you were here five weeks ago that there was some more income there, but it's quite a bit of a headache. With long-term rentals, there are niches in that with which you've tried, like Section 8. And you own a portfolio of single-family rentals up to fourplex, B-class down to C-. minus, And you describe your tenants as basically middle-income blue collar workers. So tell us more about the quick overview of your portfolio and one niche that you really have come to like. Especially with the pandemic hitting this year, I have a couple of Section 8 properties and that's really what I've come to enjoy because I get that typical income that comes in every month and I don't have to worry about the tenant paying. That's right. Now, just for an overview, just so that no listener gets left behind here, this Section 8 program, that allows private landlords like you, the listener, to rent apartments and single family homes at fair market rates, or sometimes you can get more than market rates to these qualified low income tenants. In Section 8, it's just a common name for the Housing Choice Voucher Program funded by HUD, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. So the government pays most of the tenant rent for you it's like guaranteed rent. So that's the real attraction to this Section 8 housing or Section 8 tenancies that we call it. So no property is built in mind typically for you as a private landlord with Section 8, but it becomes a Section 8 rental when you bring in that tenant that qualifies for the Section 8 program. So tell us more about why you've chosen to focus on Section 8 now that you've sampled all these different sorts of tastes, if you will, within real estate investing. I actually had my first Section 8 property a few years ago, right along with the first non-Section 8 that I acquired around the same time as well. So I've been doing it since the beginning, but recently started focusing on acquiring more of those. And there's some really good pros to owning Section 8 properties. So as you had mentioned, we have the guaranteed rental income that's direct deposited you know, the first day of every month directly from the government. So I don't have to worry whether or not I'm going to get rent paid on time. There is a, a portion, as you mentioned as well, that comes from the tenant but they pay that on time because they don't want to lose their housing voucher or get evicted. So that's really kind of the biggest thing for me is, you know, when we have something very unexpected like a pandemic, I know that money's still going to come in. So that's one of the top reasons. Yeah. So this tenant that's qualified through the program, they're incentivized to pay their typically minority portion of the rent, often 30%, where the government pays 70% because they don't want to lose that deal. They don't want to get evicted and lose that valuable voucher. So you're thinking about what's in it for the tenant. Absolutely. A couple of other things to mention with that too is if the applicant has had a really good rental history through HUD, which you can inquire about the same as any other applicant, you're really reducing some of the risks that people see with Section 8 tenants, such as damage or them not paying their portion of the home. Because again, they want to maintain that voucher and stay in good standing. So I actually think it reduces some of the risks that you would have out on the free market. Tell us about how you found these Section 8 suitable properties in the first place. And then we'll talk about how you got the tenants into them. One thing to mention is that, you know, a lot of the tricks that I have are going to be specific to the area that I live in. So that may differ based on you know people's individual geographies they're investing in. Yeah. Um, so for me personally here, I found two of the three that I have right now were on the MLS. They were just uh, typical lower income homes. So those were very easy to get. And then I did find one through a wholesaler as well. And then what about finding and placing the tenants? How does that work in matching that tenant with that property? 
That is a great question. So I advertise all of my properties on Facebook Marketplace. I've had Section 8 tenants reach out there. You also put that the home is Section 8 approved. So that notifies people that are looking that, yes, I should contact them and inquire about this. There's a housing website where you can list your property. And so we often get inquiries from there. The third way is really word of mouth. So oftentimes when you have really good Section 8 tenants that have stayed with you for a while, they know other Section 8 tenants and they'll refer them to you. So that's actually how I've gotten my most recent one. Is that Section 8 website that you use, is that local or is that national? It's national and you can kind of zoom in to the specific area that you're looking at as well. What's the URL? So the site that I've posted on before is gosection8.com and you can post your rental there and there's lots of applicants that are out there looking. It doesn't always have to be the fact that you found this tenant because they're low income, because it's the tenant's fault. That's not necessarily true. In fact, I think you've done more Section 8 tenancies than I have at this point, Andrea, even though I've been investing in real estate longer than you. My first ever Section 8 tenant was a tenant that I placed in a fourplex building that I own in Anchorage, Alaska. And the big reason that they had fallen on hard times and that they were eligible for the Section 8 voucher program is the fact that they were displaced by Hurricane Katrina, which took place, I think it was 2005, if I remember correctly, down in New Orleans. So they were really under a circumstance that was no fault of their own. So just to give an example to these people and some of their situations, sometimes it's due to things out of their control. So anything else, tips about placing tenants or finding that right tenant? couple of things to mention. You want to take them through your typical screening process. So you're not going to screen these tenants any differently than you would for other properties. If you have, you know, your minimum credit scores, income, things like that, you're still going to run through that background check, look at their criminal history, their eviction history, things like that. So make sure not to pass that up just because, you know, it is a Section 8 tenant and you think that they may not meet the criteria. There are a lot more that do that you wouldn't expect. The other thing is to while you want to make sure that you're being fair and following the Fair Housing Act and that you are accepting an applicant that's qualified, there are a lot of older tenants too that have been on Section 8 for many, many years. And that's kind of a good indicator too, if they've had their voucher for 10, 15, 20 years, that they're going to take care of your property. They're going to pay rent on time because they've had that voucher. Otherwise, they wouldn't have it at this point. That's great. Maybe an experienced Section 8 tenant is preferable in some circumstances. Then how much of the tenant screening does the housing authority do for you? I've never actually asked them that. I can tell you that they will refer tenants my way and they don't give me any background information on them other than they have an existing voucher. Let's get to something bottom line here, Andrea. What are your current returns on those particular Section 8 properties? Of course, there's so many ways to slice that. Tell us about it. So I'll tell you just kind of the overall numbers. So the most recent one that I have, it's a two bed, one bath. It's a half duplex. Unfortunately, I don't own the other side yet, but I paid $15,000 in cash for that. I had to put about 15000 in to remodel it and get it up to standards. And I rent it out for seven fifty per month. So it, it's not a bad return on that at all. Yeah, those numbers work really well. That might be a little bit atypical, right? Do you have a more typical scenario for your Section 8 return? I do. So probably the most typical I have, it's a three bed, one and a half bath, single family home. I paid 50000 for it and it runs for 800 a month. So that's more of the average of what I would have for those lower income properties. Have you found that you can get above market rents when you bring in a Section 8 tenant versus just the general tenant at large? Absolutely. So all of my properties are either at market rent or above market rent. So two of the three that I have right now are quite a bit above the typical market rent that I would get. One, I have kept a little bit lower than what I could get just because it's such a great tenant and I don't want her to leave. How does it work with a housing authority? Do you typically push the housing authority as much as you can and try to get market rent or a little bit more? How does that work? I do for first-time placements. You know, I'll try to make the rent as high as I think they could potentially go based on their HUD calculations for that. And I've yet to have them actually come back and say, you know, no, we won't pay this much. So knock on wood, hopefully that continues, but I haven't had them decline a rent amount yet. Great. So with the experience that you've had now, you own a number of Section 8 rental properties. What do you see as the pros and cons? Because there are certainly cons to this program. I think a big one is people have concerns about tenant quality. So I mentioned a couple of the pros, that guaranteed rental income that's direct deposited each month. I mentioned also if the applicant has a good rental history, you're reducing your risk of them not paying their portion or damaging the home as opposed to if it's a brand new Section 8 tenant that doesn't have that rental history. So that goes back to doing that due diligence at the time of screening. Yeah. 
The other thing is most Section 8 tenants stay for a really long time. So I know down here in South Georgia, at least, there's a big shortage of available Section 8 properties. There's a waiting list. Lots of people can't find anywhere that'll accept their vouchers. So when they get in, they stay. A couple of the others is I feel like personally there's been less risk due to job loss and income reduction or any other factors, say, you know, an international pandemic as opposed to my regular properties. The other thing that I've noticed is these tenants actually are much more appreciative. They're less demanding than a typical tenant. They want to make sure that you're keeping them in that property. And so they're very amicable to deal with, which is one of the biggest pros to me. So let's talk more about that and the effective management of these tenants over time, because you are self-managing and you're self-screening with software help, of course. But Mm. tell us about that glue that makes it stick together. What makes the ongoing management of the Section 8 tenants any different? I actually don't do anything any different. All of my properties, you know, we go in and change the air filters on them monthly. And every time we go into any property, Section 8 or not, we do cursory inspection of appliances, plumbing, HVAC, hot water heater to make sure that there's nothing crazy going on inside the property. And that way, if there is something that's becoming an issue, we can identify it quicker rather than later and be a little bit more proactive as opposed to reactive. So that's one of the main things we do to make sure there's not a lot of damage to the home. And I'm sure these tenants are really grateful for that maintenance that's regularly being done. Because really, if you think about the tenant in their profile, oftentimes we're talking about a person that's never going to be able to afford their own home and to get service and to get cleanliness and to get care and concern for the property probably feels like a real privilege to them. And that's probably just another reason why you do have longer tenant retentions because we're catering to a group that's less likely to ever be able to move out and get a home even here in an era of low interest rates. That's right. They're very appreciative. And, you know, sometimes they're on Section 8 assistance because they're disabled, for example, and they couldn't even change their own air filter if they wanted, nor could they afford to have somebody come in and do it for them. So little things like that, I'll stop by. They need me to tighten up a faucet or something like that. They're just so appreciative of us doing that. Yeah, that's a great point. During the pandemic, we have a higher unemployment rate now, even though it's come down from where it was, it's still substantially pretty high. A lot of people have lost their jobs. Some people have lost their incomes. That's kept other landlords waiting for Congress to pass another stimulus. But tell us more about that. Why Section 8s tend to work better during a pandemic? It goes all back to that guaranteed income that you're going to get every month. If they have lost their jobs, they're only still paying a very small portion of the rent. Sometimes the tenants don't pay any and HUD pays 100% of it. So during the pandemic, you don't have to really worry about those properties the same way. Any last thoughts about Section 8 tenancies, Andrea? Something that our audience needs to know? One thing that maybe we can go back to is talking about the cons because you asked about that as well. And so there certainly are some out there. I haven't necessarily experienced all these, but I've heard some stories from other landlords, you know, that could benefit from hearing this. So there is a perception that Section 8 tenants can be harder on homes and, and damage more than the average tenant. I've mentioned one way to mitigate that is to do your background screening to make sure you're getting a good tenant and then also to do periodic inspections of the property. I have not found that case. It's actually been the opposite for me, but that could be a con in certain geographies. The other one is making sure that you have the property up to standards for what your local HUD housing authority requires. So they come in and they do annual property inspections, which can be time consuming. And if the property is not kept up to standard, it's going to prevent you from being able to get that monthly rent check on renewals. And then for new move-ins, they do an initial inspection as well. So it could prevent you from placing a tenant a lot quicker if it were just a regular market rental. So that's one of the bigger cons, in my opinion, at least. The third, I kind of touched on a little bit, that's having that longer turnaround between vacancies due to the paperwork and things that have to be followed in terms of policy to get that new Section 8 tenant. The other thing to mention is it can be a little bit harder to sell Section 8 properties depending on where you are in the market cycle. It's easier to sell a nicer, more fixed up home on the free market than it is a Section 8 home typically. The last one that I'd want to mention too is rental cap. So we had mentioned that for most properties, you'll get at market rent or sometimes higher, but there are different geographies where HUD does not pay what you could get out in the free market. So you may have a cap on how high you can raise your rents there. 
Yes, of course. So this creates a bit of a dichotomy. If you want to be the sort of property provider that skips steps and isn't safety conscious, then Section 8 really isn't going to work for you. Because I've been through the experience before where prior to that tenant being placed, the case manager comes inside the unit and makes a physical inspection of the unit to be sure it's up to standards. And then like Andrea mentioned, they also do that annually as well. So if you want to be a good sound housing provider, which is really part of our mission and what we want to do here at Get Versus Education, do good in the world. That's really just another reason that Section 8 can work well for you. And here at Get Rich Education, we actually work with a provider in the marketplace that has a good and ongoing relationship with their local redevelopment and housing authority. And they really take care of a lot of these administrative and back-end things for you. And that actually all comes already rolled into the same management fee that you would pay elsewhere for what I would call normal turnkey properties. In fact, that's our provider in Richmond, Virginia. They work with the RRHA, the Richmond Redevelopment and Housing Authority. I met the provider in person two years ago, and they really show a lot of pride in work and what they do to make turnkey mesh with Section 8 and yet make it approachable for you, the investor. If you want to learn more about that, I really recommend you get the report and learn more at GetRichEducation.com slash Section 8. Andrea, it's been great having you back here on the show. Thank you so much, Keith. Yeah, great input from our own Andrea. She said she hasn't had great luck with finding qualified tenants at GoSection8.com. That could be different in the area that you're in, though. But yeah, there are a lot of pros and cons to Section 8 tenancies. I've had good experience, but a really small sample size ever since my first tenant that had that subsidy. For some reason, I still remember his name, Latif. He was a Bangladeshi cab driver and had a nice family, a wife and daughter, and they were quite quiet and respectful. So really, in any real estate market, you can be successful. You just need to tailor your strategy. There are a lot of ways that you can play it. Maybe today you want to be in more of those markets that historically have a high renter population like Memphis or Little Rock or some Alabama markets and other places. Maybe you like Florida for all the in-migration, and maybe you're telling yourself something like, yeah, you know, it might be good to have, say, 25% of my portfolio in these government-subsidized Section 8-type rentals. You are better shielded from a reduction in tenant employment that way. You could tailor some of your existing rentals to this model, or at the same time, you can tap into someone else's existing system and diversify into a market like Richmond, Virginia. In fact, that's the only place I've ever known about in my life where they do turnkey Section 8. And why Richmond? Well, it's generally a pro-business place. Just last year, CNBC named Virginia as the number one business state in the nation. Richmond's economy is driven largely by law, finance, and government. It is a state capital. It's the capital of the U.S.'s 12th largest state, in fact. You might remember that I had the owner of that provider on the show here earlier this year, and a number of our listeners have now bought and closed there since then. If guaranteed rent income has a nice ring to you and you think that it has a place in your portfolio, get the report and learn more at GetRichEducation.com slash Section 8. The rent-to-purchase price ratios on these B-class single-family homes are about nine-tenths of 1%. Numbers that really work quite well with today's low interest rates. They have in-house property management for you with the professional applicant screening provided. They own and manage more than 300 properties in that area. In fact, the provider was named to the Inc. 5000 list. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, and they have more than 20 years of experience. And if you're pre-qualified for a loan, lever up. I mean, why wouldn't you when interest rates are below the ocean floor like they are right now? In fact, this Section 8 provider in Richmond has about 80% of their buyers use financing. So learn more and see some properties. Get started at GetRichEducation.com slash Section 8. Until next week, I'm Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. 
Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.